uh, Iran too, and its design and programming and other topics. We'll come to that in a moment. Can I just remind you that the next meeting is on November the 20th, when Doran Swade, who requires uh, no introduction, Doran Swade will be talking, uh, giving us a talk with the title, The Shocking Truth About Charles Babbage and His Calculating Engines. Um, I don't know whether this is quite uh, news of the world standard, uh, shocking truths or uh, what, but uh, Doran, I, I think this is probably the, based on his PhD research, uh, which he is in the process uh, of having examined at the moment. So this will be hot off the press on November the 20th. And that will be either here or in the lecture theatre uh, at the museum. So if we can come to today, uh, the master of ceremonies really is Frank Taylor, who uh, I certainly have known for a good many years. I can't remember, it must be probably 20 years, Frank, since perhaps you and I first met. Uh, I've met Frank uh, in the BCS, on BCS committees and activities of that sort. But today he's here as one of the design engineers that worked on Orion 2 and then subsequently spent 11 years working at the NCC and then uh, the last 24 years, he tells me, of his uh, working career uh, creating two successful small companies that he was then able to dispose of. Uh, so, Frank, we're delighted to have you and your colleagues here. I'll leave you to introduce your colleagues as we go along, and we look forward very much to hearing the story of the Orion 2. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm running at the mass of this, which I don't know much to do. This is the beginning of the story of today's talk. Um, most of you will know that around 1994, early 1994, Ferranto Limited, as we in fact knew it, the family company, sadly went bust. That triggered me to write an article in Computer Bulletin, many of you may just remember, titled Rotary for Ferranti, uh, in which in fact I gave a thumbnail sketch of what Ferranti has done in its 30 odd years of the computer field. That article was subsequently processed, and I think I'm picking the right word by Hen, issues here, and put it in his ICL anthology, the first one of the two, and was seen by a lot of people. Subsequently, Alan Thompson, who's over here somewhere, there we are, um, picked up Hamish's article. Uh, in which I have stated that the Orion 2 project really showed what Ferranti could do. I believe Ferranti bowed out with a tremendous um, burst of effort before the ICT takeover, and this project showed what Ferranti could do. So effectively what I would say, in rather more polite terms, was would you like to put your mouth where your pen is with the help of a few more colleagues? So here we are. That's how we got here today. The beginning of the story of the next talk. Now let me move on to the beginnings of the Orion story. Around June 1958, give or take a month or two, Ferranti set up a working party to plan an on-ground computer. Most people will know that all the computers made by Ferranti prior to 1958 were effectively designed by Manchester University, machines like Model 1, Model 1 Star, um, Mercury, and of course of Athis as well, all designed by the Manchester University team and Ferranti had the manufacturing rights, but they were joint efforts. But, but not Pegasus? Not Pegasus. Pegasus was different. Pegasus hadn't time. Yes, my apologies. Thanks to the correction. There were on brown machines, apart from the military one, like Apollo, before, in fact, arrived. So you've corrected my wrong thought. Thank you very much. Anyway, whatever the background, around June 1950, to be correct if I'm wrong, Frank planned to uh, design and make an on-brand medium-sized machine, which would not be a result of the Manchester University Frank Cooperation Agreement. Um, part of the thinking behind this was that the Atlas market was always seen as small. Um, some academic, I believe, did a calculation around that time, early 1950s, and calculated that five addresses of our line, which I'll be able to call them, um, would in fact do all the computing which were required in the UK. 
I have no comment on that particular statement. It was decided at some point around 1958, and Ted may want to come on to this later, that neuron circuits were to be used, and there was considerable influence, in fact, in this area from my uh, first boss in Ferranti, Mr. Gordon Scarrett, otherwise known University of GGS. Um, the working party set up to build the machine on top of these neuron circuits consisted of Ted, who's here today, Ken Johnson, and Charles Lindsay, who I don't think are here today, but the hands up here they are. Um, Ted included multi-programming <coughs> specification. I'm sure he's going to touch on that. I'll just give you a few pointers to, to what we can have later. I believe Orion built on at least the principles, if not the detail, of a Pegasus-derived instruction set. But it did have core store, immediate access store, um, random access store, instead of the delay ones, which of course appeared in Pegasus. This is Ted mentioned with Pegasus, I believe, also delay lines. Okay. The machine, just by a point, had six bit characters, it wasn't by this time quite oriented, and a 48 bit work because that gave quite a lot of bit positions for manipulation, indexing, and a reasonable instruction set. And it was wrong of me to go further in that area because that I think is what Teller was talking to us about a little later. I'm just setting the scene and introducing what will become in the moment. With regard to getting a decision made, um, a decision was made after that working party did its work. The Orion 1 development, in fact, has proceeded apace. And the scenario, late 1961, early 1962, and I wasn't involved in this, so my dates might be subject to a tolerance, was that the Orion 1 development was grinding on. There were inherent problems at the engineering level, and, and Chris Burns given an address on Orion 1, I know already because I heard it in Manchester. Well, there were inherent problems with many of the shielding and knowledge immunity due to the fact he used current driven circuits. The end of development and customer deliveries were not in sight late 61, early 62. I did like to see the contract being well known in Ferranti that there was a penalty clause in the Turitz contract, that was the, the machine to be supplied to Turitz, was going to be essentially production and uh, machine number one of the Orion 1 range. And this meant that if Ferranti didn't really put its finger out, they could end up giving the machine away and still be in breach of contract. I believe that didn't actually happen. But nevertheless, in fact, legally, my understanding is that was a scenario. <coughs> From conception in 1958 to early 1962, it was already getting on for four years. And by the time the machine saw the light of day and rolled out to customers, it turned out to be a five-year development cycle. That was a long time for a machine, but it's what actually happened. Turning back now to 19, mid, early 1961 and early 1962, it was very clear that the Ferranti needed a machine compatible instruction wise and, if possible, system wise with a Ryan 1. Clearly, if you were the legal situation, it had to have a very fast um, concept of market time, a very short concept of market period. So that, in fact, if Orion 1 still was delayed, Orion 2 could be supplied. That actually didn't happen. But I think it's one of the things in the minds of the management at the time, and most certainly some of the engineers like ourselves. The machine had to be reproduced without tuning. I mentioned that because, of course, Atlas, some Atlas did evolve a certain amount of tuning. So we had a modern machine reproduced without tuning, and reliable without scores of field engineering modifications, which is the bane of the field engineers. If you don't get the design right, stable and standardised, the field engineers have a lot of work to do because, of course, they have all sorts of cars with different levels of modifications on them and have to modify the cars a little bit about the next. So, what Ferranti was seeking was a robust, reliable, maintainable machine maintained by the field engineers using diagnostics and then card swap to minimise the mean time to repair. There were, as I understand it, and again, Ted may wish to say far more about this because he was involved and I wasn't, two contenders put to the management, not I believe very openly, but again, and we have around here this afternoon, arrived two based on FB6000 hardware, which then existed and was known to be very reliable, and a machine called a Harriet computer, which again, I prefer to leave to Ted, I'm just setting the scene. At that time, there were also resources available in Prancy, the Perseus, Team in the south of England was immediately available. 
It was a very good solution looking for a problem, at least that's my understanding. There were premises available because the military division had just moved out of the Lille to Western Road, down the road in Brantnock. And if I'm not stealing his thumb, my understanding is that Ted went to Manchester to see the newly appointed general manager, or Peter Hall, not at all now, while the proponents of Harrak were on holiday. So Ted is not only a good engineer and a good scientist, I have to hand it to him, and he wouldn't say this, he's also a good politician. He went at the right moment, he got the green light for what became the one or two project. Right, now what was that project and what did it contain? Well, it is possible to represent a computer as a series of structured layers. And you'll note from what I put at the top of this visual that the whole idea of this is cribbed from the seven layer open systems integration model, which although not declared as a Ferranti output, was actually produced by Hugh Ross, who I think you'll all know and myself, in 1975, and went into the International Standards Organization. So I cribbed the ideas from that. I feel I'm entitled to since I had more than hand in it and draw what I think is a representation of the Orion tree architecture. Not the only possible one, but one which will suffice for our purposes today. Working bottom up, a decision was taken to use diode transistor logic, about which we'll in a minute, random access core store, and a clock which finally ended up at 1 megahertz. But in 1964, in the papers of the day, everyone was looking at the possibility of running the detail cars at 2 megahertz. So a two megahertz machine was possible on the cards, but my understanding is it never actually saw the light of day, and I'm open to correction on that. Above that, we have the logic design, and again, in my computer work article in 1994, <coughs> I did say that the, the uh, supremo of the logic design team was the man who designed the adder and the floating point units, because they determined the speed of the machine in the marketplace and its saleability. Well, again, I'm going to say no more about we have those today. Above that, we have um, extra codes and the instruction set. And if I can just in fact be light hearted for a minute, Ferranti, who always advertised themselves as first into the future, were well ahead of the Halifax Building Society. I'm sure you've all seen the Halifax Building Society adverts on television. We give our customers extra. Well, for years previously, Ferranti didn't only give its customers instruction codes, it gave its customers extra codes. And we've got Malcolm B, who is responsible for those, has got to tell a little bit about it. Further up the tree, we have all the usual peripherals, mag tape, cards, paper tape, drums, not dissimilar to <coughs> drums, and of course line printers. The most difficult ones to drive were of course the line printers, because they required heavy currents and quite high speed, otherwise the print would have to cut out. The peripherals have parity, and now moving on from the actual sheer hardware area, into in fact, the interface to the user in the software area. The operating system was OMP, or remember the Organ and Monitoring Program. Organization Monitoring Program, there we are. Today we're not specifically not covering that because there is in fact a little CCS event, again involving Alan Thompson, planning on that, because it involved also the meanings of timeshare. Above the operating system we have Nebula, and today we have Mark. Mark Roach is going to say a few words about that. Nebula was powerful and user friendly and a very good programming interface. I had hoped that you were willing to pass credit for DCS. He's going to come and say a few words about that. He did promise to, but um, about 10 days ago I spoke to him, and sadly his wife is very unwell at the moment, and I'm thinking of him, and he's unable to work with this afternoon. On the top of the tree, on top of Nebula, and written in the Nebula language, and using the Nebula dialogue, you have the user programs, and I'm going to move the whole of the area to mark and talk about it. So that's what Orion 2 was as a product. Right, with, with that knowledge of Tom Thompson sitting over here, who spent his whole career with Dungeon ICO, um, here is um, just a listing of some of the features and system configurations of Orion. You'll know that Orion 2 typically had around twice the core store of Orion 1. Don't forget these figures are in fact words, 48 bit words, not bytes. So it's quite a sizable core store. Mag drums, um, mag tape, and of course line printer and all the rest of it. There were in fact other peripherals available and interfaced, and a little not specifically mentioned here. I was looking at the circuit diagram last night. There was in fact a circuit interface to the Atlas peripherals 
using that as logic and logic levels in his way of requirement. So Orion was very, very um, versatile. Next question, anybody with a commercial mind is, uh, will ask is where did they go? Well, here is a list again with the Northern Tom Thompson is very kind of produced this. Where the Orions went, and we forget the Orion ones, by which Peter Burns has spoken already. The Orion 2 was the first machine, which in fact was the prototype machine, stayed at the Little House. I don't know what happened to it, presumably in the end it was broken up, but the Little House um, had to be cleared for other uses. Two of the production machines went to the Prudential Insurance Company, and we'll be saying a little bit more about those then later. Another machine went out to the South African Mutual Life Assurance Society in Cape Town in South Africa. And the last machine went to the Beecham Group Limited in Brentford, UK, where it worked very successfully for a year, for a year or two, and was then acquired second-hand by Prudential. And um, I'm not sure if there is one of them say something later, but three of those machines out of the four hundred and sold commercially were acquired by Prudential and became their workforce from 1964 to 1976. Okay, well that's a quick overview of the product, how it happened, and where, where the product in fact went to when it was sold commercially. Now as Roger said when introduced me in my job, well, my official title was Post Design Development Engineer. At least he was, as far as I remember, the score of Harvey was here today, told me to the contrary. Um, and my job was in fact <coughs> to redesign circuits that did not work during development uh, within the shortest possible time. So I had a look at most of the circuits and was prepared to do whatever was required when modifications or redevelopment were required. As far as the Orion 2 is concerned, before I was involved, there was a decision to use no logic. This uses one type of gate. I'll give you a second diagram for a couple of seconds in a minute. This, this in fact, uses one type of gate that does everything with appropriate logic design, designed operations, all operations, and and no. From an engineering point of view, it's a very clever and elegant form of logic because it standardizes everything on standardizes everything on one circuit type. I understand, and again, uh, I've not talked to gentlemen concerned, but others have and tell me something else say something about this, that the design is derived from early criminals, which were in fact a form of diode transistor logic. Um, the early Gribblon ideas, produced by Morris Gribb, also Francis, most of you will know went out to Francis Packard to Toronto. They engineered the ideas into hardware, and by the time we saw the engineered version, uh, the cards actually came back to us at the Lily Hill as ready-to-use cards to go into the machine bays uh, as the logic design was implemented. Uh, there was no mandatory development, at least to get the basic logic going, because the 701 cards, which these cards were called, uh, ran at the, the moment that they put them in the base. They used germanium junction transistors, uh, which at that time were state of the art around 1961-1962. Um, somebody may ask the question, why in fact did they use silicon transistors? Well, the answer is we did. Um, the process of silicon conversion took place in the UK earlier, early in 1994. Sorry, correction, 1964. <laughs> I knew I missed you when I did that slide. Uh, thanks for that. Um, this really, because he used geomagnetic transistor, I must make a comparison with Atlas. Most of you know that Atlas used point contact geomagnetic transistors, and as OC170s. Can somebody say something? OC170. Um, yes, they were junction, were they? OC170 point contact. Well, we'll leave it. Anyway, RC170s were, I think we'll say, they were very early production transistors, right? My understanding is that Model Arts um, made RC170s, tested all their production, and um, the highest performing transistors went to practice these matters. Right? We'll, we'll not argue the point about whether they were junction point content. I want this to be a point content. Ted has the same idea. But uh, Roger, you were. So it's on. Well, anyway. I've got the catalogue, I don't want to check. <laughs> 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 well, the point I'm making is quite a little bit of selection and tuning of you know, the transistors that went into Atlas, as I understand it. And that had to be overcome. It was. 
and he was totally stunned from this right across the market. So that was the point I was trying to make. Okay. You want to get out to selection and change the bills for it. I just mentioned the 701 car, the basic logic in the right two, nothing unusual about this. Three diode inputs, standard diodes, straight into the base of the transistor, which was quite rugged, right? One of these, in fact, went up, the collector went down, and vice versa. Uh, a very straightforward switching circuit that worked day in, day out, night in, night out, and did its job. I don't really think there's much more to say about it, actually. Uh, there were six of these gates packed on what was known as a 700 series car, which was about six inches by about four or five inches, which in fact were also the same cars that went into the late ICL 1900 machines. But uh, there were good pieces of engineering, and the sign of any good piece of engineering is that once you've done it, you never hear about it. And, and that, really is, that really was the case in several months. I think it's very desirable, and, 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 and I'm sort of training carefully now because I don't want to say Chris Burns in the corner, but anyway, to just say a little bit about Orion 2 circuits and compare with Orion 1s. The Orion 2 clock was about a megahertz, Orion 1 was about 500 um, kilohertz, but it was based on the information I had. And as I said earlier, in 1994, two megahertz clock was being investigated. 1964, 2 megahertz of being investigated. On the issue of noise immunity, the Orion 2 circuits were non linear. You either got a, a complete digit drive in the circuit and it triggered, or if you got part of a digit, it wouldn't trigger. There was very considerable noise immunity from the non linear nature of the circuit. So there was a dead band of the noise with around 70% of the middle band of a digit. In other words, the middle, the middle section of the digit between the digit and one. In contrast, um, and I thought my way through this, and again, I find it interesting and constant people to make, the Orion 1 circuits were linear, and in fact, they could, if the opportunity arose, tend to integrate magnetic noise from any source from which it should not. So the Orion 2 had voltage driven lower current circuits, but he didn't need an output of current in the basic logic circuits. And things like parasitic inductances, which are an absolute nuisance on um, computer cars, which integrate noise, were either eliminated or minimized by the virtue of a lower current switch was going bad. Okay, now I want to put my reputation on the line and give you a case history of one particular card. It became my job to redesign. Well into the development, David Smith, David H. Smith, it was David Hesitation Smith, because he had a hesitation of cycle steam and interrupts in the logic, uh, came to me and said he needed, in fact, a new cable driver circuit to drive the cables, particularly with the live printer. So I got the job of totally designing from scratch, like yesterday, uh, as I mentioned on here, a cable driver circuit which would in fact uh, produce current pulses with very fast edges, particularly to de design the white printer. The solution I adopted is known as a Darlington pair. Now before, since we've got a male audience, before everyone's uh, mind goes off in their own direction, a Darlington pair is not the pride and joy of every one and every young lady from that county down town. So forget that. What a Darlington pair is is PMP NPM transistor pair, complementary transistor pair, in which an input signal turns one transistor on and the other transistor off. Now this is quite a neat solution for the problem I had to face. If you put something like 100 milliamps steady state current down this chain, you apply a driving pulse from the driving logic. This transistor will turn on to say 200 milliamps. This one will turn off. Then you end up with a 200 milliamp pulse in fact, going out on the output between the two transistors. And in fact, it's a very fast pulse, and so one turns on, one turns off, and bang, off it goes. Very interesting circuit, did the job. My job initially was to breadboard it. Uh, breadboarding means you put a hookup, put together a hookup, <coughs> using those days on a piece of very board, with the right transistors, plug it into the machine, and make sure it works. Uh, I did that. Uh, I did the calculations of the current quite accurately and the voltages. Uh, the, the, the car was all set to do the job it had to do. 
which suddenly, being me in a hurry, I did the power calculation on the back of the number of it and got it wrong. So when I pulled the devil's circuit into the machine, there was one old mighty bank that was still around me now. I flowed it through smoke and Jack Templeton, who was Corbett's second in command in hardware, um, said, very patient, he was very patient with the other engineers by me. I think you got it wrong this time, go and have another go. Um, <laughs> within 24 hours, I got it right. And we got the car right. The final 787 card had 38 transistors on the 700 series card about this by this. It was one hell of a job to make because these were in two stacks on the car. You couldn't otherwise get them on. And many years later, I met a man called Gordon Calvary, who many of you will remember as the procurement man from Miss Gordon, who said, in 1964, I had a car that was a devil of a job to get made. It had two stacks of transistors on it in two layers. At that point, I kept quiet. <laughs> so there we are. Um, I've introduced now, I think, what Orion was uh, as a product. Said something about the politics that got him going, and I'm sure that Teddy, if he so wishes, will say uh, whatever he wishes to say about that. <coughs> so I think it's now my pleasure to introduce Teddy, who was, I think, in many ways, the godfather of the entire Orion project. He was one of the working party which got it off the ground. Um, Perhaps I can sum up Teddy by being reasonably polite by saying that he got his brain into gear by doing a tripos in Cambridge, two parts in maths and one part in theoretical and physics. And then when he got his, his brain into gear, he joined for anti and really got him moving even faster. What he did is what he's about to tell us now. Teddy, what
The other two people on the planning were Ken Johnson and Charles Lindsay, but they neither had, any, had anything to do with computer architecture, nor were they particularly interested. <coughs> so um, they and I more or less went, uh, went our own ways. Uh, I'd been a programmer for a year and a logic designer for four years, mainly on Pegasus CPU and on magnetic tape, as well as doing some architecture jobs. And on this Orion planning, I talked to everybody, <coughs> software, people, George Felt and John Davis and Derek Millage, and I talked to the salesmen, and I talked to all the various engineering branches involved in computers. So I, I would just acted as a collector of ideas, an idea or two of my own, and turning it into a coherent proposal. I um, from the beginning, I did intend the proposal to include time sharing, now called multi-programming. It was much talked about in those days in the journals, along with other things such as interleaving, but there was never any discussion of the details of implementing it. But its possibilities were so mouth-watering that I imagined everyone would be putting it in. And it was a great surprise to me to discover years later that um, how few people actually did in a full-hearted full way. Um, this, we've been doing a lot of, sorry, a lot of discussion of time sharing but with a view to another meeting Alan Thompson is organizing. And and could I say that Orion 1 included all that? And I, Orion 1 included running lots of programs at once. Oh, it's the same. Orion 2, uh, and I, I mean, uh, Orion 1, we're, we're talking about the planning of Orion 1 oh, now. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's the point. Thank you. I mean, uh, Orion 2, even more strongly than what Frank said, it, it was designed to be absolutely compatible. That was one of yes. the um Big job was to make sure that any program which would run on Orion 1 would run without any question on Orion 2. And that was quite a job, wasn't it? <laughs> <coughs> but um, uh, in, in the discussions, emails have been passing back and forth between a number of us about the early history of time sharing, which there's going to be another meeting here about one day. But um, there were various people suggested the idea, and it was in the journals, I think, all the time. And I think Christopher Strachey gave a talk, Stanley Gill gave a talk, other people may have, but I don't think I heard about it. I certainly didn't go to the lectures where they gave the talks. I came across it in various journal references, especially, I think, in the one issue of the IBM Journal of Research and Development. So that's, but, but as I say, nobody, I came across nothing which suggested the details of how one should do it. And I've got him a little quote, I can find it, from, yeah, uh, yes, just, this is just a little, this is from 5th of December, 58, at the end of the battle to get rid of neurons in Orion 1, having failed. <laughs> I think, yes, a, that's the right memo. Ah, interrupt and time sharing, I say. This, this is a memo to Brian Pollard on the 5th of December, 58, just before he resigned or was fired, whichever you prefer. Um, and I said, so far as I'm concerned on interrupt and time sharing arrangements, I feel the need for hard thought to arrive at a cheap, comprehensive and snagless set of facilities for interrupt and time sharing. This must include a detailed understanding of all the types of applications we can think of. It is the next subject I propose to think about. So that was the situation. Nobody talked about how to do it. Yes, well, then 
Now, coming on to the details of the Orion spec, one of the first things one has to decide on in designing a computer is the word length, and in our case, the character length. I've talked to George Felton over the years since, and we would both have loved to have 8-bit characters, rather than the 6-bits we actually had, but we didn't dare because of the extra memory required to store character data. And, and um, bear in mind, we were already worried about whether a machine for combined scientific and commercial use could be competitive in either field anyway, so there was a big um, concern about the size of the machine. Um, yes, we, we, we didn't dare. And, and this is an example of where one has to remember that blissful as it would be to design a machine of the future, it's no good if it's too expensive to sell now. We didn't know that we should have eight bit characters and that it would come one day. Actually, the most compelling reason to me for keeping a six bit character <coughs> was not even what I just said, but it was this. A word, uh, uh, we, I said, must have a power of two number of characters. So, with a six bit character, one could have a word length of 48 bits, which is good for floating point, and it's eight characters. But with an eight bit character, one could have 32 bit word or 64 bit, and 32 is too short for floating point, and 64 is longer than necessary, and adds a lot of expense to the parallel arithmetic unit. So that was a strong reason, as well as the waste of space having an 8 bit character instead of 6 bit. <coughs> um, last in February, when I mentioned the same, George, George suggested, well, what about Pegasus, in which we had six and a half characters to a word? And well, my argument, I think, I forget what yeah, it was then, it's the same as now, that uh, we were very keen on elements and, and cleanness of specification of instructions and so on from the programmer's point of view. And I would have been terribly, I, I can't imagine being happy with anything other than a power of two number of characters to a word. I, I, I can't, I don't think I could dare. And it's interesting, that I, I really can't think of a computer since then that hasn't kept to the same thing. I mean, 24-bit computers, 6-bit characters, and 32, 12-bit, but with 8-bit characters, 16-bit, 32, or 64-bit words. If, does anybody, can they offhand think of another computer which didn't stick to that since those days? No. It's surprising, really. Oh, and uh, yes, we assumed from the beginning that the machine would be parallel. Um, this seemed essential in order to be competitive and to match the performance of core stores. There was um, a memo from Chris Wilson around that time saying what speed he thought scientific machines needed to have in order to be competitive, which I only got a reference to it, not what it actually said, but I would imagine that it, it, it certainly made, ruled out serial machine anyway, and it probably ruled out Ryan 1, but uh, <laughs> not quite sure. You, and I know you think that, George, because you said something like that to Peter Hall once in about 1961, and you said, what change would you like, George, to um, most of all to Ryan? And you said, for it to be five times as fast. And he said, thank you very much. <laughs> that was shortly before the start of Ryan, too, wasn't yes. it? Um, then one has to decide on the instruction format. We rejected the 24-bit instruction, such as the 1900 series has, as being too cramped. And so we settled on 48-bit instruction, and this allowed a nice, comfortable um, address length and also replacement and so, uh, modification bits. So it, it made it a very nice instruction, I think. I have um, 
Mennonism notes about it's about discussions exactly at what address length to have, right down to early 1959. So we were thinking about it at quite a late stage because they were already getting quite deep, detailed logic design done by then on the basis of a 48 bit parallel arithmetic unit. Um, but what I've said here is I presume we were aware that with, with time sharing, the programs would be operating from different places in the core store on different occasions, and that would have affected, well, the ways of handling addresses at any rate. I would even add the, the starting point of this particular program's uh, store, core store to each uh, address or something like that. But um, I haven't got any notes about that. The Pegasus type of order code was our starting point, to which were added floating point and field handling instructions and many other improvements, these being mainly specified by George Felton and his programmers. And as, who was it, Jeff, was it Jeff Nuttall? Jeff, uh, John Thompson. Oh no, somebody said last, at the, at the February meeting, somebody sitting back there said, why did you have the most extravagant instruction a set of instructions in the Orion that's ever been seen in any computer, I think is what he said. Jeff Newell, was it Greek? No, I don't Not Jeff Strauss. Sounds like Jeff Newell. Sounds like Jeff Newell. <laughs> <laughs> well, which the answer that George had given the answer to me before, which is that when I got shoved off the project after the Newell battle, um, Charles Lindsay was <laughs> responsible for the, the details of the engineering. And, um, instead, well, I, well, what he did was, whenever George and his people came up with another idea for some nice instructions, he would regard it as a challenge to see if he could do it, and so he stuck them all in, more or less. Whereas, um, the engineer's job in that situation is to cool the ardor of the programmers, because, <laughs> for the reason that, that uh, my favorite tag, a little saying to myself, all when I was designing computers were always, if in doubt, leave it out, because it's always so tempting to put things in, and you can always argue in a very vague way that, that to the total performance, the bang per buck of a complete system is going to be much improved you know, by, uh, by every little addition you do, it's going to be worth several times as much on the bang per buck uh, as it costs in the total buck. So, if one didn't care about the price of the computer, one would add all those things in. But of course, one has to care totally about the price. The bulk. So, uh, you know. Right, well, that, that's enough of that for the moment. I'll come back to the, the I was going to tell you this detailed story of um, the, the battle to, to, um, get rid of neurons for Orion 1, involving an attempt to overthrow, the only revolution I've ever been involved in, an attempt to overthrow um, Brian Pollard as manager of the computer department. It was, it's a story of incompetence, and, I mean, the three of us, Hugh Dernold, not here today, I think, and uh, Harold Marchant and I were hopeless revolutionaries. We started, <laughs> at least we did decide to have one, which was something, but, uh, I'll tell you later on. Uh, now, I will now change the subject to a bit of logic. I must say some of the logic, uh, some of the, the mill, things to do with the mill, actually. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, how many of you are familiar with computer, old fashioned computer logic diagrams? How many of you aren't, on the other hand? Well, not many. Well, that's all I have to put up with it. But I think <laughs> um, well, this at least isn't, this is just a picture of the, uh, of, of the main, the, the biggest registers. This is, shows the general organization of the Orion parallel unit. We've got four 48-bit registers there, which are flip-flops. Um, the general way an instruction is obeyed is after having got the instruction out and prepared it, you know, modified and replaced, and now you're ready to obey it. 
So can you still hear me? Okay. Um, right, so you, you've got to uh, go, go to the memory to get out the two uh, operands for the instruction, put them in A or B or C. Uh, then you have the clock time when it goes through the mill and back into one of those registers, having had whatever was needed done to it. And uh, then you have another, and then you send it back to memory. Um, so this is on the original drawing, which I have, but it's not very good, but because <laughs> my friend did, because I mean, look at this. Take that for instance. Really, one could do better to represent that by one line and thus sort of say zero to five stroke zero to four seconds. So has a, I don't know to blame. Also, there's a deliberate mistake in it because I'm sure that's in. Because for subtraction, the way we did subtraction was for the inverse of the A register into the mill and force a carry into the bottom. The mill itself didn't do subtraction, it just did add. <coughs> and, and, and logical operations. So, and as you see, we could, it would do... Oh, yes, yeah, so it would do... Um, or, and, equivalent, and addition. Oh, and maybe that means plus shifts on the way in, and shifts as described on the way out. <coughs> and uh, and this, this is to do times two is for multiply, multiplication in half the number of iterations one would um, <coughs> otherwise need. And the simple way to do it. Two bits at a time, and that will say that you have to add either. 0, 1, 2, or 3 for the two bits. Um, and that's all right for 0, 1, or 2. But 3, you would have to add in two places, which you can't do. And so the way you do that is to carry a plus 1 um, in, in, into the next iteration, which is, let's say, a carry into the next iteration, and subtract and, uh, these things here. There's something about I think that shifting down to that's because the uh, <coughs> the uh, multiplicand and uh, yeah mul multiplicand and the and the uh, and the partial product being formed are going to be uh, a key, uh, partial products accumulating here. They both get shifted down two places each time. So, um, I think that's right. So in the end, you get the recall what D was for. Because I, I, I haven't been able, I haven't got through all my drawing. Well, oh, somebody might know. <coughs> Next, I think that's all I have to say about that picture. And, and the, I won't say much about this one, because that list just says the other short X, Y, Z, and oh, F was on the previous one. Oh, let me just, just in, we just then just D, D, E was we used for counting the number of iterations, that's all, in multiply and divide, and possibly shifts. Let's see what's up. F's got lost. There was an F in this picture <laughs> for the function. Uh, X, Y, and Z are the address bits of the instruction. J and W, U, V, and T. I was going to ask whether anybody remembers what they were for. Anyway, they, we needed them for. J is the current address, W is the abandoned address. Ah, I see. Of course, yes. J was the current, right? Yeah. Yeah. That will use the address you abandoned. The instruction has to be abandoned, and that's the address you go back to. Ah. So it's a string of um, one or six or one. Oh, yes, I see, because it might not be the same yeah. address as, as that. Yeah. Thank you. Right. It wasn't updated during extra. Well? Huh? It wasn't updated during extra. Ah, uh, no, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is just to show, uh, well, mostly to show how many logic elements there are uh, in, in a clock time. It was one megacycle, as you know, 
for ordinary operations. It, um, but what I really want to show here is that, uh, that how simple, how how simple and how little the logic is to do a 48-bit carry with only four extra logic levels. There are, with the way we did it, there are eight logic levels um, mm -hmm. longest path for a non-carry process for, from register back into register. And that took uh, a microsecond. And, we, and the, for full carry propagation, it's four extra logic levels uh, and the clock has plus. I see in my <coughs> in my documentation that the clock there was for, for a carry operation was 1.2 microseconds. So it's only 50 nanoseconds per yeah 50 nanoseconds per um, extra null gate. But for an ordinary sequence of events, we have. Um, there's the flip-flop registers. One of them is selected by a not control. This being no logic, if you want something to go uh, out onto the bus, you make the control zero, unlike for and logic, because uh, since these are no logic takes all of these together and it inverts them. So if you want to kill anything getting through, you make the control a one. And then you guarantee that that, that null gate has a zero output. But if you want to let the number through, you have to make the control zero, and then whatever the contents of the register is gets out on the bus. And of course, you then you can tie all these outputs together, uh, and they're ordered together. So you get whichever register you want on onto the input buses to the mill. <coughs> so we've got, uh, because there's a flip-flop which controls, which is set in advance every, every digit time to control the, which register is to be allowed onto the buses, um, that's to save a lot of time. When I mean, you have to set that in advance, it'll be a long waste of time before you even got the stuff into the mill. Um, but because it has to drive 48 nores, uh, it needs some power noring. So there's one more logic level here just to power up the output of the control flip flop. <coughs> and so we've got one level for there, two. And then we've got through the middle, three, four, five, six. <coughs> and then uh, this is not the picture, but uh, this is goes in here. It's going, this is um, the, the mill output called S sum is one of the inputs onto the bus into the registers. And let's say it's that one. And uh, we, the fl our flip flops need an input on both sides, opposite inputs. <coughs> so um, we have another two levels. So that makes eight levels altogether. That's that was the just an ordinary standard non-carry uh, digit time. And a maximum for the full 48-bit propagated carry is another four. So, which is, I was surprised. But where I heard it about it from was an article, perhaps around 56, 57, um, in a journal uh, from the National Bureau of Standards, which described this fact you really don't, it doesn't need much logic and it doesn't need many <coughs> stages of logic delay in order to, to do carry the uh, 48 or whatever the length of things is. Before that people had made a big fuss about doing parallel carries, it seemed to me well, that was my impression. I could go into this in more detail, but it's not, I will just, just say one or two words. We, the way we we always put an N um, before we named signals, hopefully, so that it would be easy to understand what they did. And a, a name like M means M always meant that it was zero for, for when it was what, what it said was true. So in this case, this means this is bit zero of the mill, and this says not trans, uh, 
transmit on bit zero. Transmit is the condition to transmit a carry, that is to say, is that there should be at least one of the two inputs to that bit. Should be a one. In other words, logically, it's not L0 or K0. <coughs> That's not quite true because it's, uh, yeah, well, transmit is actually only if one or other of the inputs, but not both. And it didn't matter in this case, it worked. But anyway. And then G0 means um, no, not generator carry in bit 0. And that's the inverse of it. And logically, it equals L0 dot K0. And then combining that, we get this is the L0 not equivalent to K0 without going into it. And then we bring in previous carries, carries from lower down into the picture. And that's the path. If there's not a carry, which lets that through, and if there is a carry, I'm sorry, no, if there is a carry, um, this is allowed through, and if there's no carry, then these are all zero, so this is allowed through onto the subject. It's uh, not very complicated. So that's the basic basic mill without carry. So when I come, that was just to set the scene for the carry. <coughs> Sorry? Lift it up. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Take the seat away. Quite right. Yeah. That's better, yeah. Um, right, well, for the purposes of fast carry, we divided the 48 bit um, unit into 12 blocks of 4 bits. And um, for each of those blocks, Within the block, we generate once if a carry came into that block, uh, we had enough logic to uh, do all four bits at the same speed, the same speed as it did on bit bits here, which took about uh, an average of <coughs> three and a half more gates per bit position. Not a huge um, penalty, and it compared with what we had before for the whole arithmetic unit. Um, then. The, that's within the blocks, but then we, we, we generated the signals for, for each block of four bits, we generated the signal saying let's carry into that bit. And we did that by, first of all, with each block we generated um, two signals, one saying this block of four bits generates a carry, and another signal saying uh, this block will transmit a carry across it carry comes in. And the condition for that is, the condition for generating a carry is either there's a <coughs> carry in, this is for block zero, uh, either, either there's a carry into, it generated in position zero, L zero dot K zero, and it's transmitted across L one or K one, transmitted across L two or K two, and L three or K three, but that's for a carry generated in position zero, or it might be generated in position one, uh, and then it has to be transmitted across position two and three, plus the same thing for positions two and three. So it's quite simple, and the logic to do that is is here, which is uh, that first equation is done by this. As you see, non we want to add these things together, so we have n of all the signals concerned, tie all the outputs together, which is an OR, <laughs> and then that, is, uh, that signal is generate um, a carry from block zero, and that's its inverse, which we will need. And for transmit, it's even simpler. The condition is simply that there's a transmit across all four positions, or, yeah, as it said, and, and the logic to do that is just that. Same, same idea. So, so now we've got um, a signal from each block saying if carries to be generated in it and if carries to be transmitted 
across it. And we use that to generate a carry into each, a signal setting as a carry into each block. And the idea is simple. For, oh, yeah, that's, that's a deliberate mistake in this, by the way, I ask you to spot. <laughs> um, I'd be interested if anything that helps I really see. But anyway, there's a, there's a carry into block one, if there's a carry into block zero, and it's transmitted across a block zero. That's a mistake. Um, that's a mistake, I don't know. And the other reason that there might be a carry into block one is that there's a carry generated in block zero. So that's the logic equation, and that's the uh, logic elements, just two. Same idea as before. And for block two, it's just the same, except it has to go across, uh, so it's more complicated because it may, because <coughs> there's one more block it might have to go across. So that's the condition. Generate, carry into block zero, transmit across these block zero, transmit across, across block one. Or, generate in block zero, transmit across block one, or generate in block one. And that's the logic for that. And the only, that would only be two extra logic levels. It's not obvious, but, it, but if one follows out the maximum chain of compared with the non-carry operation, uh, one would, if one did this for all the blocks up to block 11, then uh, the, one would only have two more logic levels for the for a full 48-bit carry. Whereas in fact we chose to have four because I imagine because of loading problems, but I'm not sure. Um, and so what we did using two more levels was generate a carry into block four like this, but then that carry into block four was used in block five, six, and seven in the same way as carry into block zero was used here, but it needed, that means that the signal which you're using into, into block four, as the carry into block four, was, um, had two more, no, no, two more null no levels in its worst case stream than the others. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Did this carry on into the, into the West Gordon 1900s exactly the same? Uh, ah, I don't know, know. but I, I, it was, it was um, I think I would say it was well known. Yeah, I'll it. tell you who did it, who did the, uh, I should tribute some of the people who, who did things. It's Glyn Emery, with the help of David M. Smith, David M. Smith, um, did all this. Right. Well, it's exactly the same as you, it's in 24-bit word in the Steve Lee's 1900s, and then later on we had to turn that into TTL and do it all over again, exactly the same. The same kind of... Fox so carry. Exactly the same, except for only 24 bit motion. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Carries, or yeah. Look at it carries, we call it in those days. Yeah, yeah. Um, carry look ahead. Carry look ahead. Yeah. Why is it, why is it called look ahead? Well, because you, 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 pro, you take a block of digits and you process the carry situation for that block. Yeah. And pass it on to the next. Quickly, yes, yeah, so with just the button. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So it becomes well known. It was already, as I say, I heard about it in 56 or 57. And um, and uh, Glyn said that he heard about it from <coughs> somebody else in Ferenti Bracknell, I think Peter Niblett, and I think uh, who I, I don't know where he got it from, presumably because it was fairly well known by then. Well, I know we bought it in ship. I'm sure. Well, yeah. Well, for a whole twenty. You mean the whole had a twenty-four minutes? Well, no, that we still had uh, had the sections. All oh, right. Four bit adders, but we had the look ahead chip as well to go with it. The, you, you mean a special look ahead chip? No, it was by then it would become a chip. What? How much was on that chip? The look ahead chip? The chip that you put on those last two. All, all those things about yeah, all, all the special block. Yes. Block generate and transmit. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, this, I guess, what about not? Yes, that's, that's the little thing here I was going to say. Was that the, this gives just a, 
but an idea of how many naws there were per bit in the arithmetic unit. Um, in the mill there were eight without special stuff to carry, plus all the uh, letters without shifts, plus seven for the different sorts of shifts, and then the um, <coughs> inputs and outputs to the registers, eight, and to carry within a block, to fast carry within each block, four, three and a half, and the, and the, and this, the block carrying and generate stuff altogether only took about one average of about one more per bit. So it's very small, uh, as well as being quick. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say there. Yes, I, I suppose I, I mean, I, I'm not surprised to hear that it, I'm sure everybody did it after that. It must have been in the 1900. You say, what? what? Yeah, yeah. Right. How, how am I doing on time? Not fine, am I? A few more minutes. A few more minutes. Few more minutes. Right. Okay. So I'll I'll, I'll now do the, the the story about the uh, the revolution or the attempt to get rid of neurons in the first. <laughs> and instead, in the middle of this, I'll read you part of a letter from Peter Hall, which is an email which he sent a couple of days ago giving the situation from his point of view at that time. Yeah, right, and uh, yes. So as I said, uh, Hugh Devonald, Harold Marchant, for those of you who knew them, and myself um, have been up for a last attempt to persuade Rand Pollard. We'd given up on Gordon Scarab being persuadable about anything at that point, so we, we were working on Rand Pollard. <laughs> and, um, I was a friend, I, I liked Gordon Scarrow, but uh, I, 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 along with most people, we regarded him as a clever man, but a technological disaster. I think, well, yeah, I know. Um, anyway, this is the story of three hopeless revolutionaries failing to succeed. Um, uh, now, I think, like, how much shall, shall I explain? You know that there was the North and the South and Ferranti's computer department and they didn't get on that well together. Most particularly, Brian Pollard didn't want to know anything about sales and programmers. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> um, yes, the, 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 you know, so here, the Man Manchester management's attitude to customers seemed odd to us Southerners. It seemed that we should produce a computer that it seemed to us that they thought we should produce a computer that we thought was good and then present it to potential customers to take it or leave it, rather than doing a bit of market research to see what people wanted. And it, it was clear to us that neurons were not the circuits to use for several reasons. Yeah, I won't go into. Um, and, and that there were an excellent alternative available within Brandy, the grid lines. Um, yes, we tried, as I say, yes, we tried to persuade. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. Actually, Bernard Swan and I think George Felton came up on, I remember one meeting, we all went up together to talk to Brad Pollard to try to persuade him to, to dump Scarrett's neurons, and we failed, didn't we? That was probably September uh, 58. And then so Harold and Hugh and myself, I'm not sure why Harold and Hugh were involved, because it isn't, anyway, but never mind. Um, they had opinions, the same opinion about it. We were that time, the last go of Brian Pollard, who, I must say, I have to say, he was very tolerant of us badly in here. <laughs> I'm looking at some of my notes I wrote at the time. It was very, I was a, sort of dif difficult, a, a difficult young man. <laughs> And we wouldn't shut up. And I had lots of like, impertinent criticisms of his way around the department. I don't know that I told him anymore. Anyway, he, he was very good natured. <coughs> um, so, so Hugh and Harold and I went up and had a last attempt and failed on November the 5th, 1958. And so we came back on the train afterwards. And um, fireworks were going up, of course, on either side of the train. And we resolved that we should have a revolution. Um, 
uh, and send a telegram, in the, the form of it would be send a telegram to Sebastian de Parenti, who is now managing director, saying we wanted to discuss the question with him. And we weren't happy with Pollard's decision, which we were sure was going to lead to a, a, a failed machine. Um, and we, we, we also um, made, made a vow to each other that we would never shave again and the forfeit was that anybody who did shave should buy eight pints for each of the others. And, and then the next thing that happened is that, uh, well, two things happened really. Bernard Swan had a word with Hugh, I think, saying it wouldn't look very good because we had sent the telegram and, we, and Bernard obviously knew we were going to have a meeting with Sebastian. But um, he said to Hugh, it wouldn't look very good if you've got three of you with one week old beards at this meeting. <laughs> And so well, Hamill's, Hamill's face was too short and it, his didn't look good and Hughes grew in some patches and didn't look good. Um, so uh, they both took him off and I was allowed to keep mine, which is dates from November the 5th, 58. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't think I got many of them. I don't know. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I should have insisted, didn't I? But, uh, yes. Um, right. Uh, ah, no, that is fine. But then, uh, so far, we were all very far in the revolution, but then we decided to send this telegram. We left Hugh to do it on his own. Was it something so important we should have all uh, written out and talked about together. And whatever is said in it, we, uh, we, Hugh can't find it, never has found it. We have no idea what was in that thing, but we do know that Sebastian didn't understand what we were getting at. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and he, had, he had a reason with us, uh, but to our astonishment when we went into it, it wasn't Brown Pollard who was there, it was Peter Dory and uh, this uh, property manager Humber in, in the south of England. <laughs> <laughs> Which, <laughs> oh, we were really very incompetent. Incompetence number one is we didn't draw up the document very carefully ourselves and discuss it. Uh, in confidence number of two, is when we got to this meeting and it was a run like that. And then Sebastian obviously had decided to take the line that he didn't want to fire us, so he wasn't even going to get onto whatever it was we wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Just all the volumes. And we were f stupid enough not to say, well, do you know what it is we wanted to complain about? We none of us sent out. So we finished the meeting, no further forward, except that Peter Dory had decided to get rid of us from Lily Hill as soon as possible, <laughs> which he did within the next few months. So, uh, 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 yeah, hopeless. Um, and then, of course, the next thing that happened was uh, just before Christmas, I think, Pollard, uh, he, 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 I know he made some impossible uh, demands to Sebastian, which were turned down, and he felt he, either he would have been fired or he resigned or whatever. Anyway, he left, and Peter Hall then took over. And we, stupidly, I mean, having seen, we didn't, I always so stupid, we, we didn't know, I mean, we could have deduced that uh, Sebastian didn't know what it was we wanted to talk about, I would have thought, but we didn't say, well, in that case, Peter Hall probably doesn't know about this neuron battle. And he didn't. Like, he said to me a few days ago that he, he didn't know about it. So, but what happened when he took over us, we were waiting for weeks, waiting daily, hoping for a message from Peter Hall saying, come up to Manchester and tell me what your complaint with neurons was. But it never came. And we never sent a message to him saying, um, didn't, don't you know about the battle to get rid of neurons or whatever? So that's, that's the third uh, calling them. So at this point, I think we can have Peter Hall's little note about what it was like for him. Yes, so he said this a couple of days ago. The Ferranti Computer Department, uh, I, I, took it over, I took it over in strange circumstances. Brian Pollard and Bill Elliott had both left under a cloud. I was asked to take over the department for what reasons I know not. I had absolutely no knowledge or understanding of computers or what they did. But it seemed, <laughs> it's, but it seemed I had a reputation for rescuing ailing departments. False. 
quite a lot of experience in maintaining large R&D departments, managing large R&D departments, and my background was pulse circuits, um, annual development of semiconducting devices, that was a win choice. I found that an important gang had left to go with Bill, and the warring factions were at me to develop what became Orion One and Atlas. Lily Hill seemed to be fine, and I, I let them get on very well. And he also said that one of the first things that happened when he took over as Peter Dory dashed up to Manchester and put it to Peter Hall that he, Peter Dory, should be made the complete manager of uh, Ferranti Bracknell, which Peter Hall did. He seemed to be suitable person. Um, now, yes. Uh, so, everything was seemed to be going on fine in Lily Hill, finishing off Perseus. So what was she to do with the situation in Manchester? I could have done with some of Arthur Humphrey's more hindsight sooner. In quotes. Gordon Scarrett had very good credentials, and he convinced me that Orion would work. If only had I listened to my old friends and colleagues at Withenshaw who had advised him not to use neurons, incidentally. And then you lot came along to rescue me, but nearly three years later. Mm -hmm. then, we, then if we had had a Ryan one made on Brimlons, um, he said, I'm, I'm sure we would have seen off the, the big competitor, which was Leo, Leo 3, which had time sharing because of the big debate. George Felton told them all the details of it. <laughs> On January the 14th, 1960, wasn't it? And they, and they, they, they did very well, I have to say. They sold, apparently, uh, some, somewhere in Australia, they sold over 50, 50 Leo 3s. I don't know, oh, maybe in 100, I, I don't know. Anyway. So, so let's do the one little tiny last bit, which is, is, is the start of Orion 2. Yeah. Um, I fill out on what Frank said. Um, I knew that, I, I, well, I two things happened. One, my girlfriend, because I, I wouldn't marry her, she went off to Canada, Audrey Williams, as she was then, and uh, July, and then I was, hadn't got that much to do in the summer, so I started thinking about an, a, a, a grubalized version of Orion again. And I, and I knew that Orion one was in big trouble. So I, I, I sent Peter Hall a, a letter, or maybe I was like, putting the possibilities using faster circuits. I think I had Atlas in mind, as we were persuaded not to. Oh, well, other people were persuaded not to, like Gordon Harvey, later on that they were too, <coughs> too um, tricky a circuit to use on a, on a really reliable, ordinary computer. Anyway. Um, so I sent this memo, and then I, and I was astonished when he asked me to come up the next day and explain in more detail what I had in mind. And I did that, and I was even more astonished when the day after that, he sent the whole Bracknell Logic Design Group, which was just coming to the end of Perseus, um, to work on it in a few days' time. And what I didn't know was that the crew was threatening to cancel their Orion order, which might have escalated to all the others. And um, so he was... Uh, that, that's why he was in such a hope, hope and succeeded in persuading them not to cancel the order by offering them a machine five times faster in um, three years or whatever length of time. Um, um, uh, Frank mentioned the Harry Act earlier on. Harry Johnson had always hankered after a 24-bit, very simple, purely commercial machine, but fair enough for his market. Um, and he and Peter Hunt and Bernard Swan had been plotting this um, secretly um, for a while. And in fact, they'd, they'd all gone on holiday at this very remote time in September when I sent my note to Peter Hall. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know about it because they'd done it secretly. And so um, they came back from holiday, all three of them, to discover that everything had been preempted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Orion 2 was being done and there's no change. And uh, what's more, I had been working on Nebula, which Peter Hunt was in charge of, so, and I'd left that too, so <laughs> he wasn't very pleased. But, 
So that, that is how, that's how Orion 2 started. And uh, I, I said to Harry, well, it's your fault that happened because, you, because of plotting secretly uh, without the knowledge of the manager. And his comment was, well, it's the manager's business to know what's going on in his, in his department. <laughs> I think that will be enough. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Thank you. There was, in fact, for me personally, still the line to some of the things Ted has mentioned. Uh, well, I'm not the world, Mark is here with us today. Microphone. I moved down to Ragnar. Microphone. You want to use the microphone, Ted? Has microphone! Oh, sorry. Yes, I see you. Microphone. Ted. It's being recorded for posterity. I was just saying there was a silver lining for me personally that uh, came out of all that Ted described just then, the, uh, uh, the end of all the politicking. I moved down to Bracknell as one of two research staff with Gordon Scout in uh, August 1962, um, not realising that Gordon's uh, career at that time was in a downward spiral as Ted has described. Um, when I did realise, and I very quietly had a word with Gordon Hart, who's here today, and got myself quietly transferred into the Iron team, which is, I think, the best thing I ever did. Okay, you've heard what Ted had to say about his part in Orion. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. There were just two of us in the early Orion team from the north of England, or Jordan from the north of England, I was one. Uh, the other one was Malcolm, who's about to speak to us now. He joined the team straight after completing his PhD in Manchester, notwithstanding the fact he's not a northerner. And uh, as I said earlier, got to work adding a little extra to the instruction code, about 40 years ahead of what the Halifax now publicised today. So, Malcolm, over to you. Yes, I'm, I'm not a Northern, but I was only at Manchester um, at the university there. Uh, I've never been to Northern before. <laughs> So I can put things the right way out. Yep. And it's right now. Well, a bit of, a bit of um, background history as far as I'm concerned, because uh, just to correct what Frank said, I joined uh, the team, the Orion 2 team, in the summer of 62. And I think at that time, um, the basic design had been completed including the design of the Estracode system, and the prototype was being assembled in West Gordon. Uh, if it wasn't when I joined in uh, August in that process, it was pretty soon after I joined, before I knew much about the machine anyway. Now, when I, when I joined uh, Franti, the, the only machine that I knew much about was the Mercury at uh, Manchester University, which I'd been programming uh, during my three-year research stint um, in the in the in pig in the, in the assembler case I knew a fair amount about the internals. And my initial reaction to the Iran 2 was what has already been said, it was such an enormously com complex machine compared to Mercury. And in fact it was also a pretty fast machine. Um, I think it was about five times faster for floating point where clearly its raison d'etre was was the uh, commercial aspect rather than the, um, looking at its customers, rather than its floating point. But it was still five times faster than Mercury's um, floating point. I joined Morris Hill, although I think it was responsible for the extra code programs. Um, although most of the design for the extra codes had been done, little of the coding had been done. And within a month or two, Morris left the work for Cooper's. So I got involved with, with doing the extra codes. There was one other program, programmer who, who also helped the logic design team. That was John Bradbury, who joined a little bit after that. And between us, we finished writing the extra codes, got them working, um, assisted the engineers in debugging the microcode by writing programs to test the particular area where they had problems, etc tried to make all the Iran 1 engineering test programs that were relevant work. 
um, wrote new ones to cover gaps where there weren't any test programs. And then finally, I helped the old team when they came to try and run the, the well, I've got it down as the Orion monitor program, but it's the organization of monitor program, is it? Yeah. Uh, what are the having differences with the right, right, right. Well, I'll call, it, I'll call it OMP. When they came to try and run OMP on Orion 2. So, what am I going to cover? Firstly, um, I'm going to try and define what is meant by the term extra code. Then I'll talk about uh, why they were used on Orion 2. Then I'll say what was extra coded on that machine. So which bits of it were put into extra code as opposed to hardware. And finally, I'll talk briefly about how the extra codes were implemented and say whether I think that the approach was successful or not. Right, well, the normal definition of an extra code is that it is a sequence of machine instructions used to simulate a hardware function. I think this describes Orion 2's use pretty accurately. I've been trying to find out, without much success, where this term was and, and design strategy was first used. I thought it was on the Ferranti Atlas, uh, because I've been at Manchester, of course, uh, I knew a bit about that. It had been designed there in the late 50s and early 60s, and I think the pilot atlas was first running um, in 62 before I left the university. So does, does, that, does that sound about right? Yeah, yeah. Certainly it was running before Orion 2 was running. So it's ahead of that. Recently, though, somebody else mentioned there were extra codes used on EDSAC to at Cambridge. Um, but I haven't been able to find out anything about that machine or whether its implementation was consistent with this definition or even when it was initially operational. Is anybody here? Operational, I think it was 56. Right. So it is well ahead. I have a feeling that the term extra code had been familiar probably from that for yeah. a long time. I'm not certain. I wouldn't say that. Anyway, why did Orion 2 use extra codes? I mean, what sort of hardware function um, is this, um, are we talking about? Well, I'll come on later to say what, what it did. All the extra codes on Orion 2 were used for basically the input and output area. Well, once right. you've got a framework there, you can use, a, use it for other things. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I, I'm going to talk about that later. Um, well, the machine instruction of the Orion was a word of 48 bits, as, as we, we've covered, with five function bits. And it was a very extensive and highly complicated order code. Six functions? Seven. 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 No? Just to give an example, the programmer's reference manual, in order to define the 101 instruction, gives that flowchart. I'm not expecting anybody to read it, but just the extent of the complexity for one machine instruction um, that is shown here. This, in fact, was to do with the conversion of card image data. Um, there was a similar one. One was to do with card reading and the other was to do with card punching. Um, quite, uh, quite an extensive instruction. So, the Iran input-output design was very sophisticated and expensive to implement. In this area of complexity, Tackled. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, when I said Ryan, I mean generically, it's an expensive architecture to have to, to, to um, 
to build and commission. And I think one of the main reasons for the extra code, Ted, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was it was seen as a way of reducing the cost and time scale involved in producing a machine that could be delivered to customers. Absolutely. Save a lot of hard um, And after Orion One's delays, it was really essential that we could do this. In addition, I think it was believed that by using extra codes, you'd end up with a design that was more flexible and would be easier to upgrade and enhance. And in fact, there was certain upgrades were done between the original prototype and the first machine delivered to the crew. Not that they affected extra codes much at all, but uh, it, there were enhancements being done even then. Right. So, what was extra coded, as somebody asked earlier? The bulk of the extra code programs were to do with the input output instructions. The objective of this, as I've said, was to reduce the cost of the IO subsystem. As well as eliminating the microprogramming of the complicated instructions to do with input output, it also eliminated the need for hardware lockout testers for every peripheral apart from magnetic tape and drum systems, which were too performance. Um, the performance required by these systems was too fast to, uh, to enable this to be done, other than the way it was. The lockout testers' effects were simulated by the extra code routines using a buffer associated with each peripheral in the extra code working space. For output devices, this was fairly straightforward. For example, when a line is sent to the line printer, the extra code copied it to a line printed buffer and the program was allowed to continue. For input devices, it was a little bit more complicated than that. But fortunately, the Orion design already ensured that all input devices had an accept button, which told the operating system that a new file on that device was to be loaded into the machine. This was used to prime the relevant extra code routine to refill its input buffers and throw out what was already in them so that subsequent requests for data could be fed from that new source. Fast peripherals, as I've already said, already had their, they still had their own lockout testers, but these were loaded and set into action by the extra code routines. Of course, once a framework of extra code is in place, any rarely used but complicated order code that can, can sensibly be performed by the extra code system. So extra codes handled fixed to floating point conversion and its inverse. Floating point standardization and justification orders were done by extra codes. Um, it was also, extra code was also entered in the division orders where the, the, where the quotient appeared to be out of range so that it could detect and deal with some particular cases, rare cases, in which the quotient isn't actually out of range. And finally, there are some obscure situations which I can't really remember where extra code um, was entered from some other instructions. Uh, the principle was that if it happened only rarely, so that it wouldn't impact performance, and it certainly wouldn't impact acceptance testing, <laughs> and it was expensive to handle in the hardware, and then give it to the extra code to sort out. Had, had that already all been decided what was to be extra code by the time you got I think so. There might have been some grey areas in these other, I mean, I think it was a Certainly division I've already mentioned, whether that was decided beforehand, I'm not quite sure. I remember it sort of coming late to me on the scene, but it might have been decided and nobody had told me. Um, and I think there were some other conversion orders where, where that was similar. Um, so I can't be positive, but I think so. I think it was decided beforehand. So how was it implemented? Well, there was a special extra code mode of operation that was initiated by attempting to execute any of the extra code instructions. 
A typical Orion 2 was expected to have 8 or 16k words of memory, although in fact they all grew as computers do when you actually come to use them. 32k, of course, was the maximum memory size. The Orion Monitor program used the first 512 words, and on Orion 2, the peripheral hardware and the extra code programs used a region consisting of the next 1.5k. So the first user program usually started at location 2k. A lot of them, each of the peripheral devices actually had a word in memory used by the hesitation control. So it wasn't all um, extra code programs or buffers that occupied that space. It was sometimes some of that. The, uh, the hesitation system also used in space, although very little on that <coughs> Fair. One of the effects of running in extra code mode is that lockout and reservation testing was suppressed and entry to the time share was prevented. This meant that once extra code had been entered, it was guaranteed that it would not be interrupted until it had finished. In fact, it was arranged that the computer died if you had an unexpected event so that it could be used for debugging purposes. Um, so it was pretty important we didn't uh, get it wrong. Finally, in extra code mode, the 64 accumulators of the instruction set started in location 512, i.e. at the top of the, of the op space. On entry to extra code, the hardware placed details of the instruction causing entry in the first few addresses after 512. So A0 contained a non-zero value and in extra code mode. Uh, 512 to 516 were, was the details of, of the instruction. And the first instruction actually obey in extra code mode was executed from 517. The first thing this program did was fairly logical, did a table lookup using the function bits that had been put into 513 in a convenient format for this purpose in order to be able to branch to the appropriate routine. Right, when in extra code mode, several instructions had special effects. These were mainly instructions of group 2, which weren't used by the extra code routines anyway, or instructions, instructions that were otherwise illegal. For example, there were instructions that loaded and unloaded the um, lockout registers and set them operational. Other instructions um, enable the program to interrogate a peripheral's control unit to find its status um, or to set, uh, set, um, set commands to it to initiate um, it transferring data. And then there are other instructions that enable you to uh, set various indicators used by the operating system when exiting from extra code control, like uh, peripheral lockout and um, things like that, proper incident. Um, there were other fairly simple uh, instructions that were just for converting or moving data sent to or from peripherals. So some of these were designed to convert, do some of the conversion for card image data. I mean, it was a two-fold process. The hardware produced the data in one form. The extra code converted that to a form that the 101 instruction that I showed her then converted it into a format that the, that the programmer could understand. So there were two layers of conversion between what came from the can't read or can't punch. Its view of the, the world and uh, the program's view of the world. Right, other instructions, uh, yeah, we're talking about peripherals. Oh, line printer, was, there was another uh, instruction um, used to uh, present the data in the correct form for line printers to, to process properly. Right, so. Was the strategy successful? Well, I think 
It was successful in that certainly the first production of Iron II was installed in the Prudential's offices in Hulu and handed over to the Prue in early December. I've got this memory of 1st of December 1964, but it's probably a convenient number. It was certainly early December 1964, and I think it was on the planned date. I don't think it slipped at the last minute at all. Um, I think the first Iran had been delivered about a year earlier, so clearly if Iran 2 was to have a future, it was as a, as a successful upgrade rather than a replacement for that machine. February 63, it didn't work for him. He wanted to hand it over to him about a year or a bit earlier. I'm sorry, I don't recall the Turing's routine at all. So as far as I'm concerned, the prototype was assembled in Lily Hill, Bracknell, and delivered to the crew in October 64. Yeah. And then we had periods of commissioning and acceptance testing, yeah. and the, the formal handover. Um, I haven't the actual date. The signature of acceptance was, the, I think, the 1st of December. I think I'll go with that. Roughly to schedule. Two weeks ahead of the, the deadline date for a 4,000 a week penalty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As I said earlier, I'm sure debugging the peripheral hardware was a lot easier with extra codes than it would have been if we'd had to use arm's length approach through the microprogramming logic. So from that point of view, I think the strategy of using extra codes was a success. However, in September 64, shortly before the Ryan 2 was handed over to the Prudential, the ICT 1900 series was announced, and I think the rest is history. Um, I was interested to see the list of Orion 2s put up earlier. I thought there were only five. I got one of them wrong. I thought it was Norwich Union that had one rather than Legions. So I stand corrected. And of course, the prototype was used extensively for software development in Lily Hill afterwards, wasn't it? Um, but I'm sure if it hadn't been a blind alley, we would have sold more machines than were actually installed and sold. So, that was the extra system. Um, anybody got any uh, questions on that? Did you do any conversion? There were certainly conversion orders, but they were, they were not extra coded. Oh, really? Yeah, that was all good. I don't think so, no. It was a binary machine, not a decimal one. No, but it... Um, there's a mixed radix conversion order there, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think that was it the 101 or the yeah. 104, one of those. Yeah, it's not the 101, they were card image. Um, I'll have a look. I indicated earlier that there was a very key link between the hardware product and the users who were very pleased with the machine. That was a Nebula language. And to tell us a little bit about that, we have Mark Roach. Um, Mark came from yet another background. Everybody came from different backgrounds in the Orion 2 software and hardware teams. Mark joined from GS College Oxford from memory. And when he eventually got to Lily Hill, he had to find himself digs, which happened to the same digs that I was in. So I can't speak from first-hand experience about the tremendous effort and dedication you put into writing these parts of Nebula. So, Mark, over to you. Right, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, I. Uh, I was called up by uh, Frank um, out of the blue uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I think probably because, um, although we hadn't seen each other for 40 years, um, he had remembered that when we shared digs, I happened to be working on Nebula. Um, there are many other people far better qualified than I am to talk about Nebula, um, and I hope that those 
uh, former colleagues and others in the audience uh, will, will certainly chip in if, if I'm in any difficulty. Basically, I joined uh, with absolutely no experience of computers at all, uh, uh, having graduated in mathematics. Um, I joined Ferranti in October 61, straight into the Nebula team. I think I was the fourth or fifth person to join that team, which had probably been in existence at that stage about a year or perhaps a little bit more. And I always suspect, and there are probably people around here who can confirm this, that the original idea was that Sandy Fraser would produce Nebula in, 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 in a year or so, um, with, with, with a little bit of assistance. Um, as I think I will tell you uh, in a moment, um, the project, I believe, when um, Sandy left, which was at the same time as I left the team, um, and they had work we had working versions of Nebula with customers, had probably consumed about 75 man years, uh, because at one stage the team was 33, 33 strong. Um, so, in, in, many, in many ways, it was a very interesting and very pioneering project, certainly for me as somebody who didn't know what he was getting into. Um, and I think one of the things we've heard today, uh, we've talked about the division between North and South in Ferranti, the, 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 the division between uh, programmers and engineers. I, I must say, this is probably, uh, uh, I, I don't think I have attended a, a meeting of somebody with an interest in software. Um, a meeting with so many engineers in it as I have today. And I'm certainly learning things that as a very junior programmer in the Nebula team uh, were completely foreign to me at the time. So it may have taken 40 years for me to catch up, but I hope I have something useful to say about, uh, about Nebula. I'm not sure, Frank, how long I've got. Um, I've prepared quite a lot of material, but I shan't uh, bore you uh, or attempt to use it all. Um, but I will start off um, I hope by um, telling you, yeah, I, I think that um, uh, Nebula stood for natural electronic business language. Uh, like on some people might have thought it stood for something else, uh, new electronic business language or, or whatever. Um, as one of the, um, the first technical writer who wrote the start work on the Nebula manual pointed out, Nebula has only one um, anagram, uh, and unfortunately that is unable. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, the decision, as, as I'm sure Ted was, was part of it, and probably knows far more about it than I did, and possibly George Dalton as well, um, the decision I think was taken in 1960, uh, at a time when COBOL uh, was only just being specified and was regarded, I think, as uh, something American, something that Ferranti would have no control over. And it wasn't, it wasn't really in the spirit of Ferranti to, to use something from, from, from somewhere else. Uh, but, also, um, but, but also, I think the, um, the, 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 the important thing in the selling of, of uh, Iran's, selling of Nebula, particularly to Iran's um, uh, commercial customers was that um, they were going to be very close to the designers of, of Nebula and that was particularly um, the case in, in the case of the Pru. The Pru uh, worked very closely um, throughout their period when they were using Nebula and before, while they were waiting for their machine and looking forward to the 4,000 a week penalty clause. Um, um, they, so in many ways, the, the, the language was designed for the customer. And we've heard a bit uh, from the engineer's side and from the microprogramming side about the problems with, with punch cards. Um, there are people here uh, who know far more about punch cards than I do. Um, all I ever learned about punch cards was when um, uh, Ferranti in, in Newman Street had taken on somebody who used to work for IBM, and he gave us a talk about punch cards. And um, the message seemed to be, you keep them in boxes, if you look after them, they'll look after you. Uh, uh, but um, the complexity uh, of dealing with people like the Pru, uh, the Pru had 30, they, they, they had two types of business, OB and IB, industrial branch and ordinary branch. I, I always get them mixed up, but I think the industrial branch was the man for, from the Pru going around to pe collect a penny a week. They had 30 million policy holders or policies. 
Um, each policy was represented by a card. They had a room far bigger than this with 30 million cards in trays on them. Some of those cards were, were, were 90 years old. Uh, uh, these life policies do go on for a long time. And um, they had a variety of punching conventions for the cards. Uh, some, of the, some of the cards, I mean, some of the, some of the data was actually written on the cards. You know, when, when, when new information came along partway through the life of this card, they couldn't get on, they, 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 hand, they hand wrote it. And, and all that lot had to be handled and, and, and in the end was converted to a run. Um, so it, it was, as, as we've heard, it, Nebula was designed with users in mind who had some fairly complex tasks to handle um, in, in, terms of, um, in, in, terms of, in terms of cards. Uh, Nebula also had a number of other features, but if we can just move on, um, the structure of a Nebula program, um, similar, I guess, to, to, to COBOL, uh, the, the distinguishing feature, though, is that the data description um, was in two parts, a physical description and a logical description, as I, and as I understand it, and others can probably confirm this. This was this was a unique approach, which certainly COBOL wasn't taking, and is certainly one of the things that made uh, made, um, made made Nebula particularly uh, suitable and powerful, and really sold it to uh, the, uh, the, the the Prudential and and others. Um, Ted, you were you were involved, I think, in the original design. You, you certainly wrote a paper with Sandy and Peter Hunt on Nebula, which I've borrowed from, as you'll see in a little while. Uh, but um, were those basically the, 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 the reasons why Ferranti decided to go for Nebula? Well, my understanding was that there wasn't a COBOL data description yet. So no, no, there wasn't. No, 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 that's right, that's right. Yes, yes. And COBOL barely existed. Yeah, well, yes. I think COBOL was all right for specifying computations once you got the data. That's right, that's right, yes, yes. But we yes. had to do the data description. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Um, I'm going to say that, say, that we, um, say, say that we are able to leave before closing time or before opening time tonight. Uh, I'm going to... Um, Skip or, or uh, drop out with some of the some some of the details, but I've certainly got some slides. If people have questions uh, and uh, want to ask questions, and, and I may well be able to illustrate the, the answers. Just to give you a, a, an example of what a bit of nebula looks like, um, that um, that that is, that is a, a piece of ne ne nebula pr procedure description. Uh, which is taken, I think, probably from, from the paper that uh, Ted and Sandy Fraser uh, and Peter Hunt published in the Computer Journal in, in late 1961. Um, I was always rather amused by the fact that, um, I, I, as I said, I joined Nebula uh, team really completely green in order to write and work on something called the Compile Compiler, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, I can remember an enormous debate going on um, as to whether I should go on a Nebula programming language course or not. I went on about three days of it, and then they decided that if I went on, stayed the full week or the full fortnight, Nebula might slip a bit, and so perhaps I should get back and, and do, some, do, some, do some real work. Uh, the real work I did consisted, um, we'll, we'll come on to it perhaps a bit, um, for a whole year, I wrote, um, I, I, I wrote programs uh, on squared paper, um, and these are almost the first bits of program I'd ever written, apart from some stuff I did on, 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 on Pegasus when I first arrived, um, and uh, for a whole year, without putting it anywhere near a machine. And so I had no idea whether what I was doing was, was going to work or not. Uh, maybe the fact that I was only allowed to, to work as a programmer for three years before I was sent off to go and look after customers uh, may, may, may mean that it wasn't actually terribly good. And I don't know to this day uh, whether my contribution was significant or not, but I think it's quite interesting, and people today would think this is quite extraordinary, that you can, you can work for a year without, getting, without, without knowing whether, whether you're, what you're producing is, is going to work. 
Um, and of course, when you did get to the machine, um, you, uh, well, I mean, we, we had, um, we, we, we used to, we, we first of all worked on Pegasus, but then, then we were testing on, on Aurora, and uh, we'd have 15 minute slots. Uh, if you were lucky, you would get four shots on the machine over a, over a 12 hour period. Um, we worked when the machine was available, uh, none of this having a machine on your desk. And, because remember, as a new graduate, I was actually quite well paid for new graduates in those days, I was getting 16 pounds, 10 shillings a week. Uh, the machines I was working on cost, uh, were charged out at 250 pounds an hour. Uh, that I think puts these, these things into perspective. Anyway, there's a bit of nebula program, a procedure description, and here's a bit of logical description uh, for, for, for part of a file on which that program works. So uh, to many, it probably doesn't look that different from, from, from COBOL. I think one of the amusing things was, was seeing a nebula program written in Swedish. Um, uh, several of the machines, as you know, were sold um, in, in Sweden. Um, and, and actually, they were quite quite sensible, except, of course, all the, all, all the names were, 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 were Swedish. Um, OK, so that gives you a little bit about the nebula language. Um, what was it supposed to run on? Um, the, the, the minimum configuration it was designed to work on um, was a friendly around one uh, with 8K words of call, two drums, uh, four wave tapes, paper tape reader, and a line printer, or, or, if you're lucky, or, or, or alternatively a paper tape punch. Uh, a pretty minimal configuration compared with today. What we have, of course, heard uh, earlier on is the fact that um, Around 1 uh, wasn't a great success, Around 2 was, and of course, in practice, um, the, 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 the successful uh, application of, of Nebula was almost certainly the Cruise, um, and that was running on a machine which we've heard earlier, it was five times, five, five times as fast, five times as far. If, if I can say that the first time I put through a, um, a, a page of uh, Nebula uh, through the syntax analysis process. Uh, this was on the Orion one at Turitz in Gothenburg where we were working. Uh, it took 45 minutes to do the syntax analysis on, 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 on about three quarters of, of, of a page of, of programs. That, that perhaps gives the idea of how, 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 how slow it was. It was, even, it was slow on Orion 2 as well because I think one of the comments made by Pru and my experience certainly working with customers was that any compilation took a very, very long, long time, uh, which was why Peter Hunt was quite happy to send me to um, hold Metal Box's hands for, for about a year. Um, looking back, I'm not quite sure what we did other than wait for things to compile, the compiler to fail, and then send an enormous great printout back to, uh, back to Brackle. Um, OK, the Nebula compiler. Um, Designed by, um, uh, by, by Sandy Fraser, um, and um, the, the compiler itself was written in a language called COMPOL, which stood for the compiler language. Um, and the Nebula compiler, as, as, as delivered to customers by the time it was finished, uh, consisted of about a thousand separate subroutines or about a quarter of a million words of, of code. <coughs> COMPOL was compiled into SIL. Uh, SIL, I think, stood for Compiler Interpreted Language. And SIL was interpreted on Orion. Uh, the COMPOL compiler was also written in COMPOL. Well, at least the first version of it was, 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 was hand compiled into, in, 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 into, in, into, into SIL. But then, uh, since uh, one, one was actually able to, to compile it, and maybe it produced some improvements. Uh, now, SIL interpreters were written for, for Pegasus and for Orion. As we've heard earlier, I think the Orion prototype in Manchester uh, wasn't available to programmers until sometime October 1962 or there, thereabouts. Uh, when I joined in October, uh, Frant uh, one, one of the team members, John, John Francis, had just completed, I think in six weeks, a SIL interpreter which ran on Pegasus. And so we were able to start do some work on Pegasus, but we very quickly ran out of uh, ran out of capacity on Pegasus, and that's where 
this sort of year of writing code in pencil on square paper came in as far as I was concerned. And uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a year before I went to, to Manchester. And like Malcolm just now, it's the first time I've been north of Watford, uh, or almost. Um, OK, so that was the lid of a compiler then written in COMPL, uh, COMPL in, in turn uh, uh, compiled into uh, Compiled, compiled into SIL. Uh, I'll just give you, uh, if I have, uh, an example of what those things look like before we move on to something uh, a little more. Um, yes, just quite quickly, um, COMPL, the, the COMPL is both an operating system and a, and a language and a compiler, I guess. Um, it operated in a data store of about a quarter of a million words, um, and it uh, stored it, this single level store uh, of, of 256k words or thereabouts um, on, uh, in blocks on, on tape. This is where your four tape decks ca come in, and of course those tape decks were very heavily exercised because we, were, we tended to be accessing this uh, fairly randomly, although uh, we did have things we could do to try and make it less random, but in practice it was, it was pretty random. Um, some of it was obviously available on drum and, and the most recently or, or most frequently accessed blocks, would, would, would 12 blocks would be in, in core. Um, Compo um, had, um, had, had seven, uh, a nest of seven words in naught to N6 which were in a pushdown stack. Um, and then the Compo object programs themselves were kept in a chapter store. Um, so that's, that, that, in very brief terms, is the uh, is, 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 is the, is the structure uh, and, and how uh, Compo was was stored. Uh, somewhere amongst all that lot, there was a, there was a SIN interpreter. Um, right, the Compo data store. Um, we it, it was a. It, it was a list. Uh, it was a list processing language. Um, my my third day at work with Ferranti. Um, my first day, I, I was given the Compil manual. No, sorry, the Nebula manual to read, and with no previous computing experience whatsoever, uh, I arrived at Oxford about the same time as Oxford's. Uh, was it Mercury or person? No, Mercury. Mercury. Uh, but it was for scientists. And I went to one lecture about it, but as a mathematician, uh, a pure mathematician, it really wasn't of any, any, any interest. Um, and so um, I, I, I came to this completely, a complete novice. Um, but um, my second day, we went to the maths lab at Cambridge, and we went to, we, uh, to attend a, a lecture on this given by John Eilert, so, which was very relevant, and it gave me a, a useful insight into what we, what I might be about to be doing. Um, so, a 48-bit bit word, um, in, in, in SIL and COMPL terms, that word was divided into five fields. Um, field A and B were normally uh, for addresses, so you build up a, a, a string. Um, if, 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 if you were at the end of a, of a, of a string or tree, then um, a m would be set equal to zero, otherwise it would be one to indicate the day as, as an address. Um, and uh, so you were able to uh, uh, construct and, and use uh, uh, fairly complicated um, uh, uh, trees and strings and, 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 and with, the, with the occasional block to represent what you were doing within the, within the compiler. Um, and uh, what you had to remember as a programmer, if you asked for some, um, some store, um, you had to jolly well make sure that at the end you freed it, uh, because you would very soon find everything would grind to a halt. Because you, you know, you, and, and when one discovered that other programmers had failed to, uh, uh, to free store, you, you, you very quickly knew, because you had no space left in which to work. Um, I, I, won't, I, I won't try uh, and explain to you the syntax analysis process, but basically um, you were able to def define the, the, the syntax of, um, 
sentences and statements, whether it was nebular or whether it was comparable. Um, there was a common uh, syntax analysis process which, which uh, uh, took the input language, the language you, you were inputting, and constructed something called an analysis tree uh, against the, uh, the, the class definitions which define the, uh, the syntax of the language. Um, just to give you an idea of a tree, that is, a, that, that, that is, that is an analysis tree for a, a statement of the form if A equals B, then C equals D, then go to E, otherwise go to F. Uh, quite interesting that uh, Sandy chose, or maybe it was Ted, to use the word otherwise rather than else. I always felt it was very inelegant that uh, we, we, had, we had only nine reserved words. In a way, going back to something that Ted was saying, it would have seemed more elegant to have had eight rather than nine. And the ninth one was otherwise, which is far too long for anybody's comfort. Everything else fit, fitted quite with, with sort of four, four characters. Uh, anyway, that gives you, you an idea of the sort of things that, that we were working with uh, as uh, in, in writing both the, the, the Nebula and the Compal compilers. Uh, here is a short, quick example of a, uh, a Compal program. This is. Um, this is one for compiling uh, a condition statement, um, I guess, I, I guess in, 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 in COMPL. Um, it, you can see that you were able to push down and pop up your, your nest, uh, and so you had a, a, a fairly... A, this, this program is recursive because it performs itself, quite capable of performing itself in several ways. Um, perform procedure, ETB, whatever, is... Uh, and I'm not sure that it can't be improved upon because that, that statement appears several times. I'm sure there would be a, a neater way of doing it. Uh, but um, the, uh, this, is, this is a procedure which is buried within the syntax and that, within the analysis tree for uh, compiling, uh, for, for use in the compilation of that particular statement which that, 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 that analysis tree represents. And so, you, you could quite easily, I mean, recursion was an important feature. It was also something that, of course, slowed everything up terribly. Uh, and, 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 and as programmers, working so far from the machine without any contact uh, with, 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 uh, with people who understood the real world, you can imagine that uh, elegant as it all was and, and, and theoretically beautiful and, and in, in many ways, the technology, uh, I, I think, was not quite up to what we were doing. But uh, there we are. Okay, um, moving on very quickly. Sil, um, Sil uh, was 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 a language which was interpreted. Uh, a Sil instruction consisted of a function, an x address, a y address, and theta. Theta being a, an operand. Um, the x address could either be a nest word, which was something known to Compal, or an x register, which was uh, I think x naught to x seven. I think there were eight of them, uh, which was known only. Um, as, as effectively working space for a a, a compil uh, for, a, for, a, for a for a civil program for the um, for for the compiler um, and um, for instance three the, the function three was multiplication so um, that example at the bottom um, would would be would be an instruction which sets uh, the contents of uh, the X, X register 1, X1 equal to the contents of nest 1 times the, um, the, the, the contents of the word whose address is in the B field of N2 or, or something, something like that. Okay. Um, the, um, I think it is probably uh, interesting now if we've got time uh, just to sort of give you a, a history of the nebula, starting uh, in 1960 uh, when Brandy made the decision and work on development started at Newman Street under, under Sandy Fraser. As I said earlier, my guess is that uh, if Sandy said, oh, well, it'll take a, a year and a bit and I may need somebody to assist me. Uh, by the time I joined, there were, well, when I joined, there were five people. I think there were four there already. I think Ted Brownhelts was probably floating around somewhere. 
I, I, I remember the name, I, I think I remember the face. Yes, I've just turned it off to Lily Hill. And you'd go to Lily Hill, yes. Um, we, uh, the Nebula team, played play often to, to Lily Hill in 1962. Um, this came as a bit of blow to me, as I'd only been in the, working in London. I just found somewhere to live after several uh, several months, of, uh, and I was set up in a, in a flat with some former university colleagues. Um, I remember I, I went to the loo in, 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 on the third floor, whichever floor the loo was on, and I came back from the loo and said, oh, you've just missed a meeting. Uh, um, we're all going to Bracknell. Um, and uh, to, to me, that was a bit of a bit of a bit of a blow. But uh, anyway, we, we, in, in, in August, we all went to went to Bracknell. I think my removal expenses were four pounds fifty or four pounds ten shillings. Um, several years later, Fran T. Moore or ICT moved me to London, um, and, and then they moved me back again. And I can tell you, it cost a lot more than four pound ten on those future occasions. Um, but. As you'll see, in '62, um, we were we began to use the Iran One prototype in, in Manchester. Uh, this involved programmers going up to Manchester to work. Uh, we had a shift system. Um, there were three shifts. Uh, the shifts were allocated for one to one to programmers, uh, which I guess it probably included the old team. Yes. Or the, or the, or, yes. Yeah. Uh, Nebula as well sharing that shift. One shift for uh, the, the design engineers, uh, who were continually making modifications, because after all this is a prototype, and another shift for the, um, uh, the, the, they were training maintenance engineers, I think. Is that, is that right, George? I think so. I, I think so. Anyway, as a, as, a, as, as a programmer, it was very, inevitably, we had a shift, whether it was 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, six o'clock in the I know, eight, four o'clock in the afternoon, or whenever, midnight. midnight. Uh, the sh your shift always followed an engineering shift, which means the machine didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I can remember once uh, a colleague and I, Derek Gears, he had a car. I didn't. Everybody else had a car. Uh, Frank, Frank had a car because I used to, used to give me lifts to work, except for the morning he forgot to take me. I, I'm still not clear whether that was absent. <laughs> um, anyway, um, the, um, the, 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 so I mean, I can remember one day we, we deliberately said, well, this, it's been disastrous this week. We won't go in next shift. So we went off to North Wales for, for the afternoon or the evening or whenever. And of course, when we went back the following day, they said, why weren't you here? The machine worked beautifully. Well, we knew why it didn't work beautifully. It's because the, the Nebula team actually made more demands, we always felt, on, on the hardware than any, any, anybody else. Um, we, uh, there's a mistake in that, I think. Um, but in 1962, um, Alan Roussel, uh, is that, no, sorry, uh, who went on, was, was one of the, uh, uh, after salesman, I think they were called, um, and he wrote a, a, a note which appeared in the Computer Journal, which reported that there were ten Iran commercial co customers writing programs in Nebula. Now those are ten, but I realised that in compiling that list of ten, um, I uh, I left out the proof. So one of those, uh, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a I misspelled tree. I think it's tree fill here, isn't it? Um, but one of those customers uh, presumably was not intending to use Nebula, and I don't actually know which, which one it was. It might have been, a, might have been the bank. Cadbury's. Yeah. Ah. Oh, well, yes, there was, this was an intention. Yes. Um, yeah, yes, I'm sure you're, you're, you're right. But few of those actually went all the way and stuck with, with, with Nebula. Uh, as I think we'll, we'll see in a, in a moment, it was probably Vicar, uh, sorry, not Vickers, uh, uh, probably only the crew, although I'm not quite sure about South Africa Mutual. They did. Yes. Yes. Um, but there was a difference between uh, you, you, you using or attempting to use, uh, as, as, as Alan wrote there, and uh, actually seeing it through. Uh, but. Um, that also gives you an idea of who the, who the, who the customers were. I think we saw this earlier on. Um, the, uh, 
having got fed up with uh, the prototype in, in, in Gordon, uh, and uh, also working uh, at, at, at night, uh, and even somewhere where during the day the sun didn't come out, um, we, uh, we, we went, uh, four of us, I think initially, went to uh, Churitz in Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, there around one, we think, arrived in February. Uh, it was more or less commissioned by the time four of us arrived in May. Um, and uh, the, the trip out there was quite interesting. I, I think Alan Thompson, uh, you, you went in an aeroplane, Washington to the Ferentis, uh, with a whole lot of tapes. Um, the, 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 the heaviest and most valuable commodity was not the people, it was these masses of, of, of magnetic tapes. And um, I don't know if it's the senior or the more important people, although it seems a strange logic, went with the tapes in the plane. I was very happy that, that, that not to go, because it sounded you, as if you had a very hair-raising trip skimming over the waves uh, from, 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 from Manchester to, to Gothenburg. Is that right? It was quite delightful, right? Oh, it was delightful, it was sorry. Nice day. Oh, right, okay. Nice um, anyway, we, we worked. Uh, the turrets had the machine during the day. We, uh, we, we, worked, we worked through the night. Uh, the, it wasn't so bad because it only got dark for a couple of hours, if, if, if that. Um, and, uh, but the Swedes used to come in after a break, you know, at 8 o'clock in the morning and I went trying to do a Swedish accent, but you know, how is your software going? We're looking forward to Nebula, ha ha. And, and it was, it was, it wasn't the best environment in which to be in which to be working it. But, uh, but uh, it, it certainly got things got things moving because uh, we had a machine to ourselves, and it was a lot more reliable than uh, than, 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 than the prototype would be. Um, we then came back to uh, Brackle in September 63. We were quite amazed to find that the team had doubled in size. Uh, there were all sorts of people we'd never seen before uh, who, were, who were busy uh, writing. I guess they were writing bits of the, compi the, the Nebula compiler in Compul, so we were quite glad that we came back with something which we thought worked reasonably well. Um, as a, we, we, then, we, we, we then got time uh, on the uh, machine at Harwell. Um, and by the end of that year, um, there were 33 people working in the team. We were all based by that time at Lily Hill in Bracknell, but the machine we were using was Norwich Unions at Norwich. So we, we spent some time working at Norwich, and some of us used to sleep in our van in the car park, not me. But, but, um, but then, uh, then I think they got fed up with uh, people staying in Norwich, and so there was a car service where, where, where jobs were taken up. Uh, each, each night. Um, I believe that the first official release, I think people were using Nebula before that, but, but in, in, in my recollection, April 66 was a fairly key date. It, it was the date that I moved on to something else, but more importantly, I, it was the date that Sandy Fraser moved on, and it was also, I think, the marked the, um, the, 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 the release of, 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 of what I would regard as, as as Nebula Mark I. Now, my personal knowledge of Nebula ceases about that. Um, I did speak to Keith Noble over the phone. The, the, I did Keith no, um, over the phone the other, the other day, and he was able to confirm one or two dates to me um, after that. Um, but basically, um, the uh, from '66, the crew were using Nebula. Seriously, from '66, to, well, they started using it uh, from the very beginning. But, but I think we can say that, that their, their, their use of it really was '66 to '75. Um, in in '67, Ewart Willey was reporting that he they completed a, a, a suite of, of 39 programs of that size, and were working on two more. Um, and uh, Keith Noble told me the other day that Nebula support ceased in 1970, and I think Mike Pickett, who's here today. It can probably confirm that. And although Prue had been uh, predicting that they would switch off Orion a bit um, later than that, I think that it was uh, they, they switched off Orion in, in their, their Orion twos in, in 1975 and replaced them with uh, 
360s or 370s. Um, Nebula a user's view. This this inevitably is, is the Prue and, 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 and you York William. I've tried to summarize some points that he's made in the past. Um, and um, back to the point that it set a standard which couldn't be met by COBOL and, and nor could PL1 meet it. Um, strong in data handling. Um, variable length records and data items, I, I, I guess it was ahead of its time in that, in, in that respect as far as the commercial language was, was concerned. Uh, the PRU obviously, like the printing facilities and, and, and the diagnostics and listing for programs they felt were good. So the PRU were, were, were definitely uh, pretty happy with it. Um, and before finishing, uh, I think I'd like to pay a tribute to Sandy Fraser. Um, Sandy was the, uh, um, uh, w w was I, I guess with some assistance from others, but really saw Nebula through and was the main designer and manager. Uh, I think he probably joined Franti in about '59. Um, he left Franti in '66, spent three years back in Cambridge, um, and then had a very distinguished career. Uh, at at and Bell Labs, where he rose to be chief scientist. Um, and I think he was a presidential advisor on all sorts of other things. Um, he now is retired and, and has his own um, not-for-profit research company. Um, the final word, uh, I spoke to you and Willie over the phone, uh, and Nebula, a tremendous success. Um, I think that um, without Nebula, um, Orion too would not have uh, been regarded as, as, as a success. It, 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 Orion two and Nebula, uh, Orion two made Nebula work, and Nebula made made Orion two work, if I can put it that way. Uh, it's only a pity that in the end it was really, we think, only the Prudential uh, who used it, and that despite the fact that there were many very important design features. Um, both in the language and in the way in which it was implemented, it was a, a, a development and implementation which, which never went any further, which applies, I think, to a lot of what, what Franti did. Anyway, thank you very much. Any questions? Well, thank you, Mark. That was very interesting. Now, there's a slight deviation from the program as originally uh, put together. Today we have Gordon Harvey with us. Gordon, where are you? Someone at the back. There you are. Gordon has very kindly brought some slides along, and I think at this point I'd like to invite him to come and show them. Uh, for those who don't know this, Gordon was in fact the manager of the entire hardware part of the Iran 2 project uh, with two subordinates, Jack Templeton and Vita Harold. Uh, I reported to Jack Templeton. But uh, Gordon is the man in fact who carried the can. So he is to tell us a little bit about it. Slides have been preloaded. We shouldn't have too much of a problem. Uh, can I apologise at this point? I have to give another lecture at 6 o'clock. Oh, right. Hamish will take over the chair at this point for the rest of the time. But thank you for a fascinating uh, afternoon. Uh, I'm sure the rest of the uh, time will be uh, equally. Uh, I, I give a lecture, I'm afraid, to my students. Thank, thank you, Roger. I'm sorry if we've taken a little longer than people expected, but uh, let's talk the story just now. So here we are, boy to go.
Uh, that's not a very clear slide, I'm afraid, but it represents a view of the back wiring of Orion 2. It comprised six cabinets, each with a footprint of about three foot by two foot. And there was a separate power unit, which was two such cubicles. And that, of course, doesn't take account of the punch card equipment and so on. There were 10 tape decks, which I think were Ampex TM2s, as I recall. Did anybody know any different? There were a lot of TM2s. Still too odd. Sorry? There were not enough lights out. That's it. That's it. And that represents. Uh, not a very clear picture. It's not very well focused, I think. Um, of the Orion 2 control disk. I think that's Brian Perth for those uh, who, who were at Millie Hill at the time. Oh, yes. And the people who, who knew Millie Hill. This will perhaps um, be uh, quite a revelation of the way it was. And for those who didn't know Louis Hill, well, that was the room above there uh, was near the main conference room. And during the summer, the loudest thing, apart from people laughing in the conference room, were birds chir chirping away in the magnolia tree. It was a delightful. A place to work, and I think that contributed something to the atmosphere of the team who were working together very well. And that was the process of loading uh, at Lily Hill, the front of the building, loading the two three section parts of the main theatre. Um, I think that's John Travis. Some of you will remember John and, and Jim. Jeff Sutherland. Is it Jeff Sutherland? Oh, okay. It, it's. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was John. Never mind. I think he's got bigger feet. We we had we developed some quite sophisticated uh, handling equipment for, for, for this gear. I think one of one of those cubicles, a three a set of three <coughs> cubicles, would weigh something approaching a, a ton. And there is one load about to, to leave, being uh, hmm? strapped up. And uh, there, there it is again. And this represents a Sunday morning in the Prudential Building in Holborn, at Greville Street. <coughs> the road had to be um, coned off, closed completely by the police. And we had this enormous crane and to get the thing off the lorry and into the, the building, which meant removing a window section. So there it is, one of the, the sets going in, almost going <coughs> There it is, nearly in. <coughs> and I think this is the last one. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide of the complete finished installation. So this really represents uh, the final stages of commissioning, um, or rather, no, the early stages of commissioning when the thing was fully assembled, but not yet uh, subject to, to test. And some of you will recognize the, the characters in that uh, picture. Well, thank you. I thought it might help just to uh, give a little flesh. <laughs>
and summarise a, a very personal subjective view as to what came out of the Orion project. So here goes. And this is this is very much my my own view. I have to say that with a disclaimer. What we did was to create a fast, a large capacity storage machine. There were no less than 3,700 cards, 700 series cards, or packages in the final machine. And this really proved their technology en masse. There was one very satisfied UK customer about which we've all spoken, the British Insurance Company, and one overseas customer from which incidentally we've had very little feedback, the insurance company in South Africa. For the Prudential, it was a workhorse for them, my understanding is, for 12 years. I believe there was some parallel running between the IBM machines that were mentioned and the last uh, Orion 2, as data was transferred from the Orion to the IBM machines. My understanding is the last one finally was switched off in 76, but it's probably current, the other two probably went in 1975. Um, the whole project led to development of an outstanding commercial language and programming user interfaces, which Mark has described to us. And it also led to the realization and efficient operation of multi-programming and time shifting <coughs> to show that it actually worked. It was, in fact, the machine that brought it to reality. In terms of achievements, it took just over 18 months from my mid-memory <coughs> from, in fact, the go-ahead to the rollout of the machine, which was a fantastically short time scale, even with those, those heavy days. September 61 yeah. to December, December 64. Right. Sorry, I've, I've got it wrong that day. Uh, I somehow thought in fact the guy was only in 62. No, you, you, yeah. you know better than I do. Because you've got, you've got the green money. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, in fact, it was 62, 63, 64. It took over three years then. Right, right, right. Was it actually run at full belt, or was it a sort of insurance? Was it done as a sort of background insurance sort of job? In case of well, land in yeah. in well, well, partly that, but as I said, partly as a, as a way to keep the proof in case. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. This is, this is done from my memory, which clearly, in fact, is uh, not as informed as others. So, in fact, we didn't quite, as I've indicated here, level paper with the quality of the artistry. The quoted yardstick in computer development is often still quoted. Seymour Crane is colleagues designed the CD6600 in 18 months out in the wilds at Chippewa Falls in the United States. Master Manuel, which in fact led to complete dedication and concentration of staff. Now I suggest that in fact the Orion 2 team were completely dedicated and concentrated on Orion 2. But as you just heard, the sound scale was pushed out a little from that which I remember. So there was, in fact, a slip in my memory, not that I was fully informed anyway. What came out of the project, again, at a high level? Well, I personally believe, and I'm speaking from some experience, as you'll learn in a minute, that um, the technology transfer from Orion 2, and the technology which Ted particularly took to the United States in, from memory, January 1964, to a then well known company called Cyber Data Systems, led to the growth of that company. Two other members of the Orion 2 team went out later to join Ted, joined the company by McLeod and George Rigg. Scientific, scientific data system really was one of the phenomena of the 1960s. When the Sigma 7, which really was a world leading machine, appeared, from 1965 or 66, almost two years, right, it was reported as being referred to by one of the Ferranti brothers as Orion 3. So you can judge for yourself. However, the SDS machines were well beating the range in the 1960s, taken over by Xerox in 1968. I understand from Ted he bowed out sometime around that time. Excuse me, could you yeah. shove that up the, up the screen? Uh, Push it up. Uh, All right. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Stanley. Okay, I suggest in 1968, Xerox decided that they wanted to buy into this new family computer industry. Um, and at that time, I believe a number of people, including Ted, bowed out sometime around that time. He'll tell you all of them. I believe the SES story is such an important story that we should perhaps devote a CCS meeting to it sometime in the future, possibly in a year's time. And if we do devote a meeting to it, and this is very interesting, there are very likely the three speakers on the platform or here on the platform today. Ted, in fact, who was a, a, a major part of the 
engineering and more up to his in SDS. Um, Mark Roach, who in fact had a Sigma 6 and run it as the user, speak as the user of that, and myself because I became a UK support engineer on the Sigma 2 when I moved on from Toronto. So three of us got involved in SDS technology. Surprise, surprise, it was for Anthony Devon. Okay, at a low level, what else came out of the project? Well, in ICL, ICL felt they might as well out of the project, as you might expect. What they got out of it was proof that the 700 series cars worked and were reliable and robust. Um, the European <coughs> Pack got design standards out of this project Thank you. for the drawing offices for new and redesigned cars. Um, I personally have to lay these down. I lay down the stands for track winds to register the curvature to kill inductance and other, in fact, important parameters on the 700 series cars, which came out of the Orion 2 project. Those were spun off from Orion 2 under the Hill Research and served the company well right to the end of double sided cars in the 1900 series when they were multi platinum. Um, the fact that, in fact, nothing has ever heard about it means yet again it was a reasonable piece of engineering. You only hear about the bad pieces. <laughs> right, the last point I just want to make is that the common hardware uh, with the FP6000 uh, ran all the field engineering stuff in the Orion 2 days on that hardware, it ran all the learning curve. So when in fact the FP6000 became a 1904, which it did uh, with a floating point unit in 1905, the field engineering stuff will run up to speed and I still got a lot of that. So there we are, the gentlemen. That, I think, is at the end of what I think was a reasonably successful story. You've heard the good and the bad. Uh, you've heard the side stories. Uh, and you've heard quite a lot about the internal workings of for anti-stroke, ICT stroke, ICL. Thanks for your attention. I think at this point, we will be meeting to further discussion, some of which we've had already. Thank you. I just forgot to ask to, to thank my co speakers. Uh, when I was asked, in fact, if I could put this list together, the answer was I personally couldn't, not the whole scenario. So I've got to thank my co speakers for giving their parts of this story, which I think yeah. is a good yeah.
when we first helped the staff of the Prudential install Nebula, Chris Atkinson set up an operating system with a cycle of 10 magnetic tapes for uh, um, developing the programs. And the Prudential said, this is a rotten system. We're experts on organizational methods. We can think of a much better way of doing it. Chris Atkinson said, I'm sure you can, but we've worked this one out, and we really haven't got time to change it just yet. Could you please operate this one just for the time being? About five years later, uh, one of the Ferranti staff said, well, we think we might have a better operating system. We can't change that, Mr. Atkinson said so. <laughs> one question from an outside of the team. It looked for me as though the Orion one was not such a disaster as you predicted, since you managed to sell about a dozen of them. So, um, my right in thinking the U2 was in some nature an insurance policy which actually didn't, wasn't ne entirely necessary. Well, what I said before, it's partly an insurance policy, Peter Hall started it as, and partly he started it in order to keep the crew from cancelling. Yeah. Those were the two reasons. He told me not so long ago that he started Orion 2 and so that he could sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly was going to have a comment here. I said, Orion 1, I think, was basically a very sound machine because the technology was so that it was going to take quite a long time to get it right and get every detail worked out. And it did. It took the best part of five years. Nothing wrong with it. But well, in the commercial the market and legal conditions, some other solution was required, and that led to Orion 2. So nobody's knocking Orion 1. It's a type of machine that was described to us by Chris a little while ago. But it did have a long time from conception to market, for, for very good reasons. It was the hardware that let it down. I wouldn't say it let it down. I think, I think once, once the decision was taken to use neurons, you were in for that appropriate time scale. Yeah. And I mean, well, I just <laughs> well, as you heard from, Chris, uh, from Colin Mitten just now, the moment um, the computer's through the door, it's obsolete. And that must say it's still there. You buy a PC, it's obsolete when you get it on you. I think I'll give you a slightly contrary view, because having been in the Jacques end of trying to keep the beast running, there are sorts to run. I would say they more or less bankrupted to guarantee both in the amount of effort in the field engineering organisation to keep them running, and in the manufacturing, the, the West Garden has spent an awful lot of effort sort of just to make the Orion ones around delivered. If there had been a sort of more cost-aware um, time-scale slipping-aware culture in Ferranti, it perhaps might not have gone on so long before the insurance policy that eventually was uh, brought up on by tenants, so that, 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 uh, if that had happened sooner, the friend would be in a different position. Um, the Nebula story was ahead of its time in one respect, in that it, uh, it really hammered the hardware to go with the signal level store, and that contributed to this the slowness of time and all the rest of it to get jobs to get the comp compilation jobs through. If uh, it eventually got through in Orion 2, if the ICT merger, if at the time of the ICT merger the sort of perception had, of, that Nebula was a success had been valid, then uh, ICT could have then put a random access or an obvious thing for disk storage. <coughs> Orion 2 was crying out for it. Just, but, but that development, there were then into rationalisation of company activities and some decisions were made that the Ferranti on brand machines weren't the, way, weren't the way forward. I suspect Nebula got lost in that sort of policy. But uh, that's a, 
sort of with, with hindsight, perhaps to capture some of the rules. Further points? I'd like to uh, put two things on the record. Uh, one thing I should have said about the installation, the, the uh, photographs that were shown uh, were taken on the 19th and 20th of September 1964, and I think the handover occurred, as we said earlier, on the 1st of December. So uh, that process was pretty rapid, as well as the development process itself. The second thing I think is worth putting on record uh, mention has been made of the FP6000. Uh, perhaps uh, not everybody knows that FP stands for Ferranti Packard in Canada. And I think I might be saying that the original so called Griblons were developed by Morris Gribble in Ferranti, Edinburgh. So with them, with them, sure. Okay. Were then transported or acquired by Ferranti Packard and then came back to UK as the uh, elements that were used in Orion 2. Right. Thank you. Well, well gentlemen, I, the, the time is uh, running up against us. Uh, it's been a fascinating afternoon. I think I would only, in closing, add one further comment that we were very sorry to hear that Peter Hall wasn't going to be able to be with us, but we sent him our best wishes. Uh, I'm quite sure that he would have had some very pungent things to say in closing about the relationships between engineers, customers, uh, salesmen, if there are any, and uh, that whole aspect of the Ferranti story. Uh, it's been a fascinating afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Look forward to seeing you again in the next session when Donald Swade will no doubt be in his usual exciting form on Charles Babbage. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.